Good morning. Good morning, friends and fellow RMPers. What's the politically correct way to say "fellow" in, in uh, you know in a in a I don't I just, I just gender neutral fashion. I just said that. I go. I don't like using those terms. But hey, welcome all to uh, our annual celebration of the San Francisco Bay Regional Monitoring Program, or might I call it the not strictly Bay Monitoring program. Indeed, this is a festival that uh, celebrates all this effort that, that, that we've come together on in improving our understanding of the science of the Bay. And the Bay is the, the central focus, but we don't just monitor the Bay. We monitor what goes into the Bay. We're even going to have a talk about what goes out of the Bay today and various aspects of how we use Bay our regional monitoring program process to collaborate on generating the best information possible to make inform the best decisions possible. So we, as usual, I like to just recognize that as with this other hardly strictly concept, we actually have are, are widely known and, and admired by other communities. And we, everybody keeps asking us, how do you do what we do? And we do what we do because we do it and we do it well. So, Thank you all for being here. We're going to have a good show today. And don't forget, the last item is a, a good social as well, which is part of bringing us all together. We have good breaks, and we have good lunch periods to also have excellent interaction. So, but as with any good festival, we actually have essentially four stages in one associated with each of our sessions, focusing first on an overview with some of the key highlights of what we've been finding out about the Bay as a whole. We're going to then segue into it. The second half of the morning after the break, a, a great session on what goes in and what goes out of the bay. I, I like the title, Some Watersheds Through the Bay. And then this afternoon, we're going to focus on first uh, on our two, two key areas of, that we're attending to these days, first nutrients and then contaminants and emergency search. So, we, so each of them is going to be a show in and of itself, but as a whole, it's going to be a great show. Now, it's now my pleasure, but it's to be part of what's becoming a, I'll also say displeasure, becoming a standard practice these days and an emerging part of our celebration is to recognize key R&P participants. So uh, starting with uh, people who are retiring. I mean, I should say re retiring participants. So first I want to recognize Bruce Wolf, the executive officer from the Regional Water Quality Control Board, who has been doing so for, oh, you know, we're, it wouldn't be too long to see just short of 20 years, if you will. Uh, but beyond that, Bruce has been at the board for 42 plus years. Uh, uh, only 40. Oh, sorry, Bruce, I'm, I'm aging you. But that touched it. But he's been there as part of five decades. So he has been a, played a key, key role, played a major role, if you will, in many, many issues that the board's taken on, and particularly in his term as executive officer, though he wasn't directly engaged in the RNP. He obviously had a key role in use of R&P resources to help him and the board make uh, the most informed decisions. And, but he does have an indirect role in that he, he has long served on the, the board of the San Francisco Estuary Institute. So he knows a lot and pays a lot of attention to what we do here. And, he, and I, perhaps he's missed one or two here and there. I, I can't remember when Bruce has not been to an annual meeting. And, uh, but thank you, Bruce. Let's thank him for, for all his contributions. For the, you know, so I, get, I don't have time to say all I love to be able to say about Bruce and then others that we're going to recognize. The next person I want to recognize who's also retired, Bruce is, is retiring at the end of December. Mike has retired, Mike Connor, and he, he we recognize him for two reasons. One, he was the executive director of the Estuary Institute and as such played a key role in the growth of the Institute and the, in the regional margin program and enhancing its, its joint fact-finding and collaborative spirit and reputation. He then moved on to become a general manager at the East Bay Discharges Authority, one of the bigger R&P contributor participants and continued, though, to be actively involved in many aspects of the regional monitoring program. And as you can see, that he, he has 16-ish years in involvement. I looked at this picture, and I go, oh, it's not necessarily a great direct shot of Mike. But on the other hand, it made me cause to think about 
how how wise Mike is and how he is forthcoming with words of wisdom. And so this is sort of indication that he was obviously giving some wise comments to the press regarding, I think this was the Oraloma at Oraloma, where the horizontal levy project is maybe. But Mike, we hope that you will continue to come and participate in as many forums as possible and continue to give us those insightful words of wisdom that you have always been able and willing and, and successfully giving us. So thank you, Mike. Reiner Haneke. Reiner, you know, and I have known Reiner for quite some time because you can see that he is he has been around for nearly 20 years. Reiner played a key role because both it shows here that he was the RMP manager, which he indeed was. He also was the executive director of the Estuary Institute, but he also was a scientist in the RMP team before he became RMP manager. So he played that role of both playing. A, uh, being part of the RMP as a scientist as well as a manager and a big part of the spirit that you've always brought to the table, Reiner, and, then I, and I appreciate that you've engaged with me in this, is how we bring managers and scientists together and, and making sure our monitoring is driven by well-stated well management questions. So you've done a tremendous job of making that part of how we do business and extending that concept to the Delta. We appreciate that and appreciate all that you've done for us. And again, we hope that you'll still be around to give us your, share your wisdom with us. So thank you, Ryan. Is Naomi here? We had noticed um, that she had been here. So we're, we'll, uh, we're going to go ahead and celebrate her and might have to ad lib something later. So Naomi Baker, who's here, here by her because she, we work closely together. She heads up the planning division at, at, the, at the Water Board, which oversees all our standards actions, our monitoring, our monitoring TMDL development. So she's a, been a key player, both from the Water Board and how we use information from the RMP, but also how the RMP de delivers needs and questions to the, to the RMP. So she's a key player in that two-way street and an act actively involved in many aspects of the RMP over the 17 years she's been here. So we're going to, again, miss her, but hopefully, because she's a, she's a youthful retiree, we, we expect that she will put her energy towards greater good for the Bay Area, which hopefully will include giving us some further attention. So let's, let's thank Naomi. So that's, that's it for now. Uh, hopefully we, you know, this is good. Unfortunately, as I said, unfortunately, it's a, you know, an emerging issue. And unfortunate for me, I'm losing some very dear partners, um, associate, these four, and I'm, I, I, I don't look forward to more of this happening. And I will just tell you right now, I'm still around and planning on being around for a while. But I, please stay with me. <laughs> And as we move into move move ahead now into the program, I just want to have us all just thank you for being here. Thank you for be, making the RMP as great as it is. We don't need to be, you know, yes, we could get greater, but we are great, and we will continue to be because we are active participation by all of all of us. So let's give us ourselves a hand that we we are so good. <laughs> so I'm gonna. I introduce myself, I'm Tom Mumley from the Water Board, and I'm going to moderate our first session, RMP Highlights. And as you can see here, we have you know, three talks, one by Bill Trowbridge on, uh, on highlights, recent highlights, and, and, uh, and I'm going to come back to Phil in a second, then followed by Robin Stewart from, from the USGS, who's a you know, long-serving uh, ecologist, hydrologist, and ecotoxicologist at the, at the survey, particularly focusing on, uh, on work of them is getting into the food web and, bioaccum and associated bioaccumulation, particularly associated with mercury and selenium. So she's going to be telling us her words of wisdom about selenium. She knows a lot, a lot more. You know, we've learned a lot from her. Good indication of uh, illustration of how we bring good partnerships to bear both with USGS scientists as, as part of our R&P, so it's uh, most excellent there. By the way, Robin, Robin comes, I believe, from Canada because she went to school there. She got her bachelor's 
at the University of Victoria in biology and her PhD in ecotoxicology from the University of Manitoba, and but has been with USGS since 2002 at the Menlo Park campus, start participating in the National Research Program. Lastly, we're going to have Don Yi, which we we all love, and <laughs> and I I particularly have, yeah 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 yeah. 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 Well, you you might have a he might be like I'm, I'm referring to the fact that he gives good presentations. We all know, and I appreciate the fact that like me, he's like has a background in chemical engineering. He's got his bachelor's in chemical engineering from MIT, but then wisely decided to become an environmental engineer. Got his PhD in environmental engineering. I get I, uh, we we share a chemical engineering background and applying our chemical engineering prowess to by protecting the environment or making it better versus making it worse. So I really appreciate it. And, and, and as he needs to say, uh, Don provides incredible support for much of what goes on in the R&P because of the clear understanding of chem chemistry, chemical processes, and the like. And he's, uh, I don't know what we're going to do when you decide to retire, but you're not, I guarantee <laughs> And uh, so, okay, back to Phil. I'm going to, you know, Phil, give, give me a second. If you haven't heard, fortunately, Phil is leaving us. So Phil Trowbridge has been uh, the, the program manager for, we're getting, we're into, started the fifth year, I believe. And uh, those of us who have been working with Phil for this period, is, he's, he's brought a tremendous enhancement to the R&P, taking, you know, not that it was, well, basically, part of enhancing the management of it in terms of being able to do more with the budgets we have and and improving our governance structure and many, many, many aspects of it. And Phil is another example of uh, an engineering scientist who is involved in, in, in management. You do a good job of keeping your feet in both sides of things as you manage the R&P, but also bring a sharp understanding of many of the technical aspects of what we do. So thank you very, very much, Phil. Let's all give Phil a thanks. <laughs> and as he comes up, I'll just remind him that this background, you know, he's like Phil, okay, Phil actually was in the West before, went back east. He's from the east, from family from New Hampshire, and that's a big reason why he's back. His family's important. He's a but he, uh, he got his uh, BS in geology from the University of Washington. Well, actually, that's, that's, yeah. And then his master's in civil environmental engineering from MIT. So another MIT guy. Yeah, yeah. uh, but that means he's one of those engineering geologists, which I've learned are very sharp people. And they, and they know, they, uh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, he's going to give us a, a, this is sort of his, his one song you're right there. Yeah. Uh, but I, thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, all right. So Tom covered most of my introduction, so I'm going to just skip all of this. Um, um, so uh, the uh, the move that Tom alluded to, you know, and unfortunately, this is my last RMP annual meeting, and uh, because I need to move, return to New England. Um, but this new move and other things that are going on in the world has made me think about change and the time of change that we're all in. And so that was the theme I wanted to cover in this presentation. So we're in a time of change on many fronts. Um, and I feel this very acutely as I'm about to leave this wonderful job and move all the way across the country and, and start over somewhere else. Um, I also feel it acutely because the RMP is adapting to all of these changes that we're experiencing. Um, so I'm going to focus this talk on four major changes that I see uh, that the RMP needs to adapt to and the changes we're already making in response, but the things that we need to do more in addition. So the first one I want to highlight is a decline of federal support for monitoring. At this meeting last year, uh, Jim Clern and Dave Scholhammer both announced their upcoming retirements from the USGS. The water quality cruises that Jim has managed uh, for the bay for the last 40 years have been critical for understanding the ecology and hydrology of the bay. The reason this is important for the RMP is that it provides the overall water quality context for all of the other measurements that we make. Uh, there's no way that we could hope to understand 
the fate and transport of toxic contaminants if we don't understand this bigger picture. The program is the longest continuous running observation program in any U.S. estuary. It's a major feat. Uh, the data and the knowledge built on this data have helped explain changes in the bay as a result of floods, droughts, biological invasions, and major climatic, climatic shifts. They've also influenced uh, major policy decisions. So it came as a major shock to us to learn that the USGS was not planning to backfill Jim's position. Uh, which would jeopardize this long-running program. This, uh, if this happens, the RMP would need to increase our funding to support these bay cruises by three or four times, which would make a major dent in our budgets and our ability to do other work. This is still under negotiation, and what's going to happen is still in flux. Another federal program with dwindling funding is the Suspended Sediment Monitoring Program. Uh, this program is important because it tells us how much sediment is coming into the bay from the delta and how much sediment is moving between different parts of the bay. So last year, um, the monitoring station at Mallard Island, which monitors how much sediment is coming in from the delta, which is the largest single point, the largest single source of sediment for the bay, was left unfunded. And the RMP had to jump in. And, and provide funding to keep it running. Uh, the Army Corps has put in a funding request to cover this station in future years, but that decision rests in Washington. Finally, stream gauges around the bay are critical for understanding the flows of sediment and water from our watersheds to the bay. Uh, these gauges are critical for, under, for calibrating watershed models, for understanding sediment loads, and for assessing the the payback and the effect of the millions of dollars of investment on green infrastructure that are happening around the Bay. Last year, after the North Bay fires, um, the RMP jumped in again to reactivate gauges in Napa and Sonoma so we could assess whether there were changes in the runoff of sediment and uh, runoff and sediment as a result of the fires. So you may be aware of these programs. We've talked about them in other RMP meetings. You may, but you may think of them as individual studies. But you know, part of my job is to think about the bigger picture. And I see this as a bigger trend. Another program that's not on this slide, but Robin, Robin will talk about later today, is the long-running clam monitoring program for selenium in the Delta. The, I feel like the RMP has responded admirably to these changes. We've stepped up to take over federal duties for critical monitoring. Uh, we are in active discussion with the USGS and other partners to sustain this important time series of the, of the Bay Cruises. But the sad reality is that we cannot possibly uh, take over all of these duties, even in the short term. So we need to either do without or get them restored. So in my opinion, this is the biggest challenge that we face, and it is already flat upon us. This problem took a long time to develop, and it's going to take a long time to solve. So I have a couple of pieces of advice. Uh, one is to invest a modest amount of RMP dollars in developing strategic monitoring plans. My experience has been that people will fund monitoring only if there's People, someone has done the hard work to show that the design and the technical aspects are sound. The RMP has the technical know-how and has the flexibility to allocate funds to do this. These plans can later be used to attract federal, state, and foundation dollars. So the second change I'd like to highlight is new technology. The new tech is, is something we're all aware of on our phone, the fact that the thing we just got used to is now obsolete. Uh, but that also uh, affects our environmental monitoring equipment. New tech is good. It gives us new information. It gives us new insights. There is a downside, though. It's, what, you know, it's often complicated, and it, and it affects our ability to interpret the results. The RMP has been quick to embrace new technology for measurements, uh, witness the use of the non-targeted analysis techniques, 
that we use for our emerging contaminants work. This technology allows us to uh, look for contaminants without having specified target analyte lists. So in effect, we get to find out what's there without knowing what to look for. For example, in our most recent study with this technology, um, we discovered um, diphenylguanidine, which is a, a component of tire rubber in a site that's influenced by stormwater. Uh, we would have missed this. This wasn't something we were looking for. Uh, and if we'd used traditional techniques, we wouldn't have made this observation. Based on the results, we're, we're embarking on a three-year study of emerging contaminants in stormwater. And Becky will refer to that later in her talk. Similarly, the RMP jumped in with both feet on microplastics as the technology improved for us to measure these new contaminants. The microplastics work is an example of the RMP at its best. We, took, we started with a low-cost screening study and then took a step back and assembled a group of microplastics experts in a new work group and developed a strategy for monitoring the bay and the nearby waters. This planning really paid off when the Moore Foundation agreed to fund a two-year study to implement most of the strategy for a total amount of almost a million dollars. But now we're facing the challenge of learning how to to interpret the results of microplastic analyses. We're tackling fundamental questions about how to characterize and report microplastic data. You can see here it's, a, it's a, a very complicated mixture. Protocols do not exist for how to do this because it's such a new field. So it is a good example of how our ability to measure things is advancing faster than our ability to interpret them. Finally, moored sensors have been a boon for our ability to study nutrients in the bay. Having data every 15 minutes lets us see the rapid changes that occur. The technology has even expanded to phytoplankton uh, with this imaging flow cytobot, where we get unprecedented information about the algae that are growing in the bay at very short time scales. The only downside of this technology is the ten tendency to drown ourselves in data and also the incompatibility of the new data formats, in this case, pictures, with the water quality objectives that were written 30 years ago. On balance, the positives of new tech definitely outweigh the downsides. Uh, but we have to take steps to manage this change. We've done this before with careful planning, intercalibration studies. But I think the new environment forces us to go a step further. My advice is that we need to start investing a proportional amount of funding into toxicology so that we can keep up with the advances in, chem in chemical uh, analyses. The first and most important RMP management question is basically, is it something we need to worry about? And without risk-based thresholds, we cannot answer that critical question. I also recommend that we engage more with assessment frameworks. And I've been the major break on this lately. Uh, I've been personally uncomfortable with getting involved with interpreting water quality objectives, because I feel that's the domain of the water board. I'm still uneasy, but I feel that we need to spend more time on learning how to interpret these mountains of data that we're collecting with new technology. Because if we don't turn these mountains of data into, inform if we don't turn this data into inf information, we might as well not even collect them. So the third change I'd like to highlight is climate change. So climate change affects us all, uh, and the RMP is not immune. I'm going to just highlight a few ways that the RMP has and should respond to the fires, rising seas, and droughts that buffet California. So the North Bay fires were a tragedy and a major event in the Bay Area. One of the great things about the RMP is that we're nimble and we're able to respond quickly. And we partnered with the regional board to add non-targeted analysis to post-fire monitoring to assess runoff and burn areas. The goal is to learn if there's anything that we should be looking for after fires that we wouldn't already expect. 
and Kevin is going to give a talk about uh, this monitoring uh, later. Sea level in the Bay Area is expected to rise by 3.5 feet by 2100. It's now accepted that one of the major obstacles for marshes to, to keep up with this rise is a lack of supply of sediment. Suspended sediment monitoring has been part of the RMP since the beginning. In fact, Maureen is going to give a talk about some of our previous work later today. So it was natural for the RMP to take a leadership role and form a new sediment work group this last year. The group met the first time in January and came up with a long list of critical studies needed for sediment fate, transport, and beneficial reuse. But I have to stress that the topic of sediment is way bigger than what the RMP alone can handle. The new wetlands RMP, as well as the resource agencies, flood control agencies, BCDC, and the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project are also working on this topic. So one of the challenges I see with sediment is a growing need and interest, but a strong need for coordination and integration among all the critical partners. When I moved to California, we were in the grip of a five-year drought. Uh, I'm sure you all remember the news cycle with mandatory water conservation orders. Uh, you may also remember things that were happening behind the scenes, which is pressure on water agencies to increase the amount of recycled water that they produce. At first, the RMP could safely ignore these recycled water projects because they were small, and they, could, they didn't affect discharges to the bay. Now, this is changing. Water recycling is starting to change the wastewater discharges to the bay, in particular in places like Lower South Bay. Also, the purification technique of reverse osmosis generates waste that is six times more concentrated than normal effluent, which makes it difficult to dispose. The water agencies are not part of the RMP because they, have not, they do not have a discharge to the bay. But we are now entering a point where that may need to change. So there are many challenges ahead with climate change. For the RMP in the short, short term at least, adding new participants from the wetlands RMP and the water agencies could be a huge change for us. The upside would be an increase in the amount of funding and the amount of resources available to tackle the issue. We wouldn't have to dilute our existing projects. But the downside would be giving some control and making room for new organizations within a program that's had the same group of people, the same group of participants, for 26 years. Therefore, we need to spend some time on working on our governance structure to make sure we can all work together. The last change I want to highlight is staff turnover. So when I announced I was leaving my position as the RMP manager, I felt especially bad because of the wave of other retirements and changes that are also happening at this time. In this photo of the steering committee, which was taken less than a year ago, three of the 11 people have already moved on, and I'll be the fourth. It's not a blip that will go away soon. A generation that entered the workforce with the Clean Water Act is retiring. Also, there are political forces at work that are leading to more early retirement. I'm concerned about this change because our professional and personal relationships are the glue that hold our program together and maintain forward momentum. An organization can handle a certain amount of turnover, but too much, and we might lose the things that make the RMP special. A sense of community, a shared purpose, and trust. So my advice is to put some real effort towards staff development and relationships in this time of transition. Make time to maintain old and to make new relationships. Do succession planning within your organization. Budget time and meetings to bring new people up to speed. And also take some time to read the great historical article that, that Jay wrote for the 25th anniversary. So as I wrap up my, my term as the RMP manager, I have a great deal of pride in everything we've accomplished. 
and especially how we weather the changes that have been thrown at us. The, some of our greatest successes have come in response. We responded to floods and fires by doing the types of monitoring and studies that everyone wanted but no one else could do. We responded to financial pressures by cutting costs and finding new money from penalty funds and foundations. We did not shy away from the new tech challenge of microplastics. And we had an immediate impact on national policy with the microbead ban. But there are new challenges ahead. And in this slide, I've tried to highlight the biggest ones that I see and what I feel like we need to be doing at a macro level. I have no doubt that there will be others. But these are the ones that are staring us in the face. So I wish I could stay and help you all tackle these new challenges. Uh, but duty is calling me away. I will miss the RMP terribly, and I will miss all of you even more. But it gives me great pleasure in knowing that you and the next generation of RMP leaders will bring the program to new heights by riding the relentless winds of change. And thank you, as always. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. No. I, yeah. I'll, I'll note that one of, you know, it's one of his last slides he had a picture of a sailboat. One thing I've learned about Phil, a lot, a lot of great things about Phil, but he's an avid sailor, and I know you'll miss that. Your week, your often weekly sailing adventures, and you know, so maybe that will give him cause to come back. So we, he does promise that he will look for opportunity to come back. So, all right, moving on, uh, Don. Well, look at that. See, he's making an entrance just in time. <laughs> all right, welcome, Don. Don's going to know about everything we wanted to know. But, uh, I often... Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, I had too much coffee, so I was trying to decide if I could hold on for 20 minutes. <laughs> so I'm um, here to talk to you today about uh, work we recently did, um, writing a report on dioxins, kind of collating information that RMP and, and others have collected over probably the past decade. Um, and, you know, it's been a long time coming. My hair has gone from 90% gray to 75% in that time. But at least we got it done, and I'm not retiring anytime soon, hopefully. Uh, Okay, so what's dioxin? You look it up on the web, and you're going to get a um, description of something like this, which is pretty good. Um, you know, it's, it's a byproduct. It's, nobody intentionally makes stops, and, um, and so they mention these chemical synthesis, synthesis pro projects, uh, products, and, but they're missing an important thing, combustion. So even something like diesel buses will create dioxin. Um, you get like 0.03 nanograms per kilometer traveled. And EPA toxic release inventory lists a whole bunch of stuff. And notice only like one of them is, is a synthetic process, and all the rest are combustion. Um, right. So, to quote somebody, uh, Dachshund is a bunch of really bad hombres. Uh, you know, DF7 G gang. You know. <laughs> so short-term effects, obviously, they can create skin lesions, chloracne, and and the worst case is death, and it's one of the more toxic pigments out there. So oral dose, uh, lethal dose, kills 50% of guinea pigs at one part per billion, and rats are a little tougher, you know, if they come from New York or whatever. <laughs> 40 part per billion. And this is compared to, like, other things, that, you know, arsenic, ricin, uh, cyanide, uh, you know, a thousand times higher, and only... Uh, one thing I could find was a little bit lower. So bug tox is about 100 times lower. So don't piss off your plastic surgeon. And then there's kind of less sublethal effects, you know, long-term exposure and chronic exposure, which include cancer. So what are dioxins? Well, there's dioxins on the left side. 
is tetrachlorodibenzodioxin. Um, and you'll see uh, on the right side of the urans, it's very similar structures, chlorines on the end. And the only difference uh, with urans is you have uh, one less uh, thing, uh, oxygen in the ring there. So toxicity of these depends on the number of chlorines you have and their positions. And they may typically measure toxicity as a toxic equivalency, so it's toxicity relative to TCDD on the left up there. And so the TQ for TCDD is 1, TCDF is like 10 times lower, and then the octoforms are much, much, much lower. Now there are some PCBs with TQs, for example, PCB 126, the coplanar PCB, has a TQ of about 0.1, you know, so for, for this talk, we're, we're focusing on the combination where dioxins plus urans we're going to call dioxins. So we take dioxin and combine it with dioxin, we get edoxin. <laughs> so what are the uses of dioxins as chemicals? As I said, there's not a lot of functions for them, but one of them is for poisoning political opponents as poor Victor Yushchenko discovered. But in the end, they don't really know who did it. Could have been the Russians, or could have been some 400-pound guy in New Jersey on his couch. <laughs> There's also this in those response studies, Victor Yushchenko, again, prime example, post and pre-exposure. And of course, as analytical standards for uh, chemical analyses. So interestingly, when you look up the word on Google, they, 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 there'll be a little chart, and I clicked on it, and this is what I got. That it shows you the usage of the word over time. Um, so while well, Google is like amassing all the books in the world, they're kind of counting up words. Um, so this is a timeline from 1950 to about uh, 2005, and you see increasing use of the word dachshunds. It's about part per million level uh, at the end. <laughs> So, you know, first came into popular usage in the 1960s with Agent Orange. It was the byproduct of the synthesis of that uh, herbicide. Um, it also came into news in 1978, Love Canal. There was a, a toxic landfill that overflowed and poisoned a bunch of homes and, and affected the residents there. And so in response to that and many other environmental disasters, of course, CERCLA was funded uh, and, and established in 1980. And of course, on this timeline, Victor Yushchenko got exposed to dioxins in 2004. And I got exposed to dioxins in 79, but to the word, not, not a lethal dose. I wouldn't be standing here otherwise, right? So why do we care? Well, 90% of um, human exposure to dioxins comes from food, mainly uh, dairy products and fish and shellfish, which particularly concerns us here in RMP. And so in 94, OEHA uh, issued a fish consumption advisory for a whole bunch of contaminants, including dioxin. Um, back in 2004, uh, we wrote a conceptual report for the Clean Estuary Partnership. Uh, this is the only picture I found of, of Mike on, on the web. It looks like it's uh, from his MWR days. He, he's very young there. Um, and we had, at that time, we had measurements in RMP fish, and we had some ambient data. We had a NOAA EMAP survey from 2000 or so, and three stations for RMP water uh, that we had done Caltoxics rule measurements for. And we had really scant loading data. So there was like a, a regional board report where they're trying to summarize the information. They had a limited number of stormwater studies and, and some guesstimates on air deposition. And then uh, we had done some studies on municipal and refinery effluent concentrations of dioxins at that point. But despite that relative lack of data, we just took a swing at it and made a very crude mass budget, you know, so crude that we had to hand draw it. And basically, the, the most important loads it looked like at that point were local tributaries, accounting for, you know, about five gram per year, and uh, air depth. So clearly, out of that, um, we need more and better data. Uh, certainly, one of the challenges is a lot of non-detects with dioxins that, that, you know, these sub 
parts per billion levels that we typically find them. So RP established an RMP adoption strategy work group, like so many other work groups. And out of that came a work plan where we were going to prioritize, given the high analytical costs, um, monitoring the, the tissues, because that's really kind of a, the endpoint of interest or patient's interest. Um, loads, because that, that gives a sense of where, if anywhere, we might find some reductions. Um, ambient level is just to say, okay, you know, here, here's this stuff coming in. Are we actually seeing it out there? Um, and it helps us to do uptake and uh, mass budget models. And then also, of course, just to say, hey, you know, have things changed over time? Uh, it's, it's kind of a convenient way if you can't go back in a time machine and measure concentrations from the past. So is San Francisco Bay impaired by dioxins? Unfortunately, they don't have a doxalizer. Um, Although if it was at 0.02, we're over the limit. So, and they don't have home test kits either. So, <laughs> what we use instead is the fish tissue concentration. Uh, the screening level in the OEHA was the 0.14 picogram per gram, and you see for white croaker, pretty much every fish except for two there, luckily got away, um, exceeded that threshold. Likewise, shiner surf perch. We might call the fish are above that threshold as well. But it's not totally bleak. There's some hints of recovery. So for example, in South Bay China surf perch, if we do a regression over time, you know, guesstimate about uh, two to 5% decline depending on how we handle non-detects. So the, the red line is handling non-detects as zero and the blue line is, is handling them as though they were at the detection limit. So it makes a little bit difference of, of what your projected decline is, but it, you know, in all cases, you still see a decline. Um, when we look at other areas and other species, it's kind of a mixed bag. Some of the places you'll see declines, and for some species and others you won't. But the question is, well, are these declines uh, food web shifts or changes in the ambit? So just like Robin showed the big shift from Potamocorbula, you know, we have to wonder, well, you know, is this entirely due to change in, in loading and, and exposure, or, or is there something else going on? So there's some hints that land sources uh, have declined. So we did a bunch of wetland cores, and we looked at dioxins in them. Uh, so this is a plot uh, going down. Uh, it, it's deeper sediment than older sediment. Uh, the red line indicates the 1950s atomic bomb testing line, where the deepest uh, layer where we found it. And in general, um, you see that this the surface concentrations, uh, you know, where this line ends, are a little bit lower than they have in the past. So there was a peak sometime probably in the 1970s or so. So we also see that the surface of the wetland course up here is actually higher than the open bay numbers, which is marked by the little X over there. And then, of course, we see like in the deepest sediment, it's, it's lower. We, we had relatively few sections, so we don't actually know where it drops back to near zero, but uh, we, we only have relatively few points. So there's some evidence that, uh, you know, some of the stuff that's high in the wetlands near the shore is getting out to the bay. Um, so unlike in the wetlands, you see that surface concentrations at uh, you know, dioxins are highest, and it's pretty uniform in the top. So, you know, it doesn't seem to have like the peak or at least as dramatic a peak as you saw in the wetland cores. And then, again, it's, it's lower in the pre-industrial layers. You can also see kind of this uh, shore to, to open bay gradient uh, when we plot it on a map. Uh, all of our highest sites uh, kind of are wetland, oops, back, 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 okay. Our, our wetland sites, uh, big circles, and whereas in the open bay, they're kind of more small, uh, smaller circles and more moderate vari variations among them. Uh, we also had an opportunity to grab a, a copy of the Dredge Material Management Office. They've been compiling data from about the past decade, various dredging products, uh, projects around the bay, and you see a similar pattern. So, so like sort of these near shore sites that the, the DMOMO had uh, collected samples, uh, you typically find the higher concentration. So these gradients kind of suggest that actually we have some near shore sources. It's not all air depth and uniform everywhere. Applying this kind of in a different way, we have uh, on the horizontal axis distance from shore, 
and vertical axis with dioxin concentrations. And so again, you see like all the, I mean, there's a lot of low concentrations near the shore, but um, all the highest ones are, are pretty much near shore. And it quickly drops off to kind of a background level. It's fairly constant through much of the bay. So this suggested something that we had seen before for PCBs. Um, we had plotted PCBs here against depth, but in general, as you get further from shore, you get deeper. So, so this is almost the same plot. And again, we see PCBs also get higher as you get closer to the shore. So, you know, can we reuse the kind of this conceptual model that we had formed for uh, PCBs of, of nested sum of embayments um, for dioxins? So, of course, I was very happy because then I can recycle my poem from last year. And I love the graphic. So PCBs and dioxins are similar. Um, here's a plot of uh, dioxins on the vertical axis, PCBs on the horizontal, and pretty much you know, they, there's some correlation. Um, PCBs have about 50 times the concentration, about four times the TQ. So there's a lot more uh, you know, PCBs, and because of that sheer quantity, they add more to TQs than dioxins themselves do. Um, in general, the PCBs co-vary with the dioxins. Um, so as you get higher PCBs, you also find higher dioxins in many cases. And so, you know, it sort of suggests that there might be some opportunities. I mean, not all PCB sites will have high dioxins or vice versa, but there might be some opportunities for co-management. But despite their similarities, uh, PCBs and dioxins are different. Um, my daughter gets really upset because my wife can't distinguish my little ponies. Um, even though they're quite similar, there are differences. So important thing, yes, is that, uh, you know, dioxins have air sources, like Fluttershy has wings. <laughs> so uh, Air Resources Board and BAQMD and EPA had a project back in 2002 to 2006 measuring ambient dioxins in the air. And uh, we asked them, well, did you calculate the position on that? And they said, no. And they said, well, can we do it? And they said, sure, knock yourselves out. So we did. So we took our air concentrations that the uh, Air Resources Board got and calculated some deposition rates. Rachel Allen at SFBI helped me out on this a lot. And we took their data. We added the Great Lakes calculation method for air deposition. And we got a new Bay Area air deposition rate of 46, it's not 42, TQs per day. And, and that's a huge difference from our previous estimate about three. So we were like, whoa, OK. So clearly, reducing air sources um, going on in the future will be important if we want to make a dent in dioxins. So that kind of begs the question, oh, well, are forest fires important, uh, people ask. So we took a stab at that. We did a little bit of arm waving. They have a dance style. It's called whacking. I learned this every day. New things. So a little bit of air, arm waving. Um, we took numbers out of literature, you know, for the emissions rates and total mass burned in, in the fires. And, and we estimated about 11 grams TQ generated by those fires. And so then we do a little bit more arm waving. I can't do that. but. <laughs> And about, you know, figure about 10% of it might have made it out in, in that first year right after the fire. So that translates to about one gram TQ getting to the bay or, or about three milligram per day. So, you know, big thing that came out of all this, uh, you know, we had new improved loads. So our old number one was local watersheds. Uh, but our new number one we think will be air deposition to the bay. And then again, for context, uh, from the North Bay fires, we're estimating three meg per day, which is maybe three percent of the total. So it's, it's some effect, but not really that big. Is is our first order guess? So you know, clearly the air management agencies are ratcheting down emissions for various other purposes, like PM 2.5 and things like that. You know, so there's some hope uh, that that these things will also get reduced as, as well. So we move from the 04 crew budget mass budget to a slightly less crude uh, mass budget now. Uh, biggest change here, uh, air depth went up quite a lot. 
uh, delta numbers went up by about threefold, and our numbers for local trips went up maybe 50 percent. And then we updated uh, the inventories in the water and the open bay by a little bit, but not a huge amount. So clearly there are continuing information needs. Most critical of them, of course, is, is the measurement of impairment um, that we get out of tissues. Uh, there's some debate internally about what's more important. Uh, I'm, I'm on team status, Jay's on team trends. We have arguments. But the good thing is they're useful for both status and trends. So we, we can share a cookie at the end and, and be happy. <laughs> We also need to get more data on near shore sediments. The DMMO data is suggested as well as the wetland cores. I mean, there's some evidence of really kind of more localized sources or pathways, let's say more strictly, that, that we hadn't really thought would be important. Um, and it might provide some surprises, like some, some areas where we hadn't really anticipated that there would be high concentrations. We did find them uh, in the DMMO data. And then, uh, eventually, over time, we, we do want to reassess whether or not the loads have changed. Um, the last watershed data that we had uh, to review was back in 2010, and the Air Resources Board data, you know, it's almost like a decade plus old now. Um, and so if any of those actions have really taken hold, uh, it, you know, it would be good to see that. So lessons learned. Well, San Francisco Bay is clearly still impaired by dioxins. Uh, Gradient suggests that we have near shore sources or pathway, um, but also that our one box model probably is not adequate to kind of deal with these spatial differences. Um, Doxins are similar to PCBs, so you know with the co-occurrence there might be some chances for co-management. Um, overall, conditions have improved. The course showed us that. Conditions are continuing to improve, I, I think, in evidence by the biota, and conditions will improve probably more, but slowly, due to better air regs and implementation of green infrastructure. So our takeaway message, uh, later we will be sitting on top of less dioxin. Thank you. We do have time before we go to the panel to do a question or two for directly to Don. So, so Don, um, we know that dioxins come from, can come from burning plastics, but the, the increase in air deposition is pretty a shocking increase. Do you have any ideas about what the root source of that is? It, it's not an increase. It's, it's that we didn't know what we were doing before, right? right? <laughs> but, but relative to some of the other things that we're seeing, it, it appears to be the biggest source. What's causing it? Any ideas? Or where should we look next? There's a certain amount from, from global. I, I think I probably need to go back to sort of the Great Lakes data. I think compared to the Great Lakes, we weren't actually that high. But, um, you know, there might be some numbers over the Pacific that we can see how much of that originates locally versus is non-locally. Um, but, you know, e like I said, even diesel burning creates uh, some some dioxins. So, so there's, there's kind of the... As, as we continue to use fossil fuels, burn trash in, in other parts of the world will, will affect here, you know. So, um, you know, and, until we stop burning stuff, basically, <laughs> it's going to be an issue. So. I got a Jim first, then I. <laughs> I really liked your hand-drawn conceptual model. I wish I could do that. <laughs> Um, the, the thing that stood out to me in that was the sediment inventory because it's by far the biggest number there. And I, so I've got two questions. How did you calculate that? Because it must depend on the depth that you go down into the sediments. And second, what does it mean for persistence of toxins regardless of what we do to the atmospheric loading? Thanks. Um, so that that um, mass budget was kind of based off the one that Jay had done a long time ago, and and definitely the um, the assumptions on the sediment depth uh, matter in terms of determining the inventory. We use 15 centimeters. It's kind of like a middle ground. Um, you know, like there was an Army Corps study of iridium penetration. Like they kind of spread iridium in the surface water, and they found it. You know, to the 23 to 33 centimeter thing within six months. 
you know, to, uh, in some places, not everywhere, you know. So, so we figure, okay, that's kind of the extreme. Um, and then you, you kind of look at the, you know, the mixed toxic layer or warm burrows and things like that. And uh, like in Fuller's work, you know, you, you'll see somewhere up to 30. So we kind of split the difference and say, yeah, you know, half the places are maybe up to that deep. Um, so that affects that. And what, how that bears out in terms of the mass budget is that, you know, the half time for the, the oversimplified mass budget is, is like about um, 15 years or so. But again, I think the gradients show us that that, that assumption of kind of the well-mixed bay is, is a little bit off because clearly, you know, it takes some time to move away from the edge into the open bay. So I think the, the real half times of, of decrease are going to be slower than that. So thanks, Don. It's a great presentation. And um, thank you for analyzing some of the BMMO data. Um, Jim, you kind of preempted a little bit of a question that I had as well. And um, I think if you're looking at dredging data, you're looking, you are looking at a pretty reasonable depth profile. So you could actually be bring, analyzing um, not just the, you're, you're, it's a composite sample often. So you're, you're probably analyzing it's a little bit mixed. It's not, you're analyzing something from that, that high peak that you were talking about. So how do we, how, we're going to have to figure out how to evaluate whether or not the influence of that peak in the, in the profile uh, on the estimates that you have versus something that's at the surface. I don't know if you did a little bit of a, any kind of a comparison. You probably didn't have the data to do that. Yeah, I mean, particularly from, from the dredging data, I mean, they'll just take a core to cover. You know, it, it's not you know, the main core. I mean, magnet, so they'll accumulate a lot, but it'll be pretty mixed. And I think so. some of these haven't been fresh for a long time, so we could be seeing some of that the estimate could be that signal from historical. Sure, sure, definitely, definitely. Mike. Uh, to follow up on that, Alan, the ratio of total amount in the bay to uh, annual load is seems way too low, and it makes you wonder um, either a lot of stuff is escaping the bay, much more than I ever would have guessed firsthand, or else we've got our inventory way, way off. What's your and because in the, if anything, dioxins, well, it shows from your court, dioxin loads have dropped by a factor of five to ten over the last thirty years. So in fact, you'd expect this almost implies that the half life in the bay is, uh, you know, less than less than a year, ten years ish. So it's it's really interesting question of putting that total load in. The perspective with the annual. Yeah, I, I think part of part of the issue again is sort of like the one boxing of it that that it, it moves everything out too fast, and so the reality is that that these these loads at the edge of the bay are, are you know coming in and taking a while to get out to that middle there, you know, and and so we're not accounting for that in the inventory. I think if we had you know a, a wider spread survey, you know, let let's say maybe maybe that that inventory would go up you know, 50% or, or something just by, you know, having having more concentrations around the edge to kind of try and calculate the total mass out there. Um, but yeah, definitely there, there's some issues there, you know, again, we're not working off that much data. So certainly the air depth numbers might be a little bit off and, and we're not doing, um, you know, stuff that settles in Central Bay probably doesn't settle out, uh, you know, and, and probably gets exported pretty fast out, out the Golden Gate. and so. You know, there's kind of these three dimensional hydrodynamic and sediment modeling things that, that we don't really count for, like in this really simplistic view of the world. So. Okay, we got one more, and then while Don yeah. answers question, I'm going to ask Robin and, and Bill to come down here, and we can continue asking Don questions, but we also can ask both panel questions. So, Bill, uh, you can bring the microphone. Yeah, um, it, was, it was nice talk, very entertaining. You know, I, ne I never understood the conceptual model better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The one question I have was, uh, you know, the this area is well known to uh, you know the one of the top you know the area uh, contaminated by PBDEs. I wonder if you have done any model like that uh, you know, using the uh, bromine dioxin uh, mass budget. Okay. Yeah. I think um, 
Good. Angstrom, uh, some, some research for the University of Minnesota had looked at the bromine dioxins, and, and I don't think they were terribly high here. Um, I can't remember the, the information, but we, we definitely had done limited measurements, uh, concentrations much lower than the chlorinated. Um, so in terms of TQs, I, I think still more risk from the chlorinated than the brominated. Thank you, Don. That's great. Thanks, Don. And as you can see, we are our, our full tails bag up here open for any questions. But I, uh, I was remiss in reminding you all one thing at the beginning of, the, of today is that all these presentations will be posted on the RMP SFEI website. So if uh, you know you want to get your hands on some of these neat, neat slides, they'll be available soon. So, but with that, though. Let's uh, challenge. We got a great panel here. Let's challenge them. They're all wise and have words of wisdom to offer and in response to our questions. So, come on, let's go. Well, we're getting caught up on today. Helen John. Uh, oh, thank you. Didn't see that. Um, so, Don, this was a follow-up from the last discussion. You mentioned the co-benefits of co-managing with PCB, and it sparked, I go, oh, well, but we we know a lot about PCB, and you spend a lot of time on this, and my my impression is that the PCBs, I mean, we, as far as loading and persistence, that's still a big problem compared to what you've been talking about here uh, in, in Dachshun, and you want to just comment a little more on that? Maybe that's another topic for us. A panel on PCBs, but I, I just trying to get caught up on the relative uh, effect of loading. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah, I, I think um, when I first released the first draft of this report, that was a comment. It's like, well, you know, don't get hung up on this too much. I mean, clearly there are PCB specific sources. So actions taken to manage those probably won't do that much for dioxins. But where we're talking about kind of these this more generalized spread, kind of that that regret. I had PCBs again. You know, uh, it, it's partial behavior. They act like, so. Try and knock out PCBs through you know uh, reducing uh, you know uh, urban industrial sediments or something like that. You're probably also grabbing a certain percentage of dioxins with that and, and helping on that front. So, uh, Phil, your your needed question sort of integrates perfectly with what Robin and um, Don have presented because they've both presented indications of a real problem, and we have to sort of then and actually for both of them we're not spending any money really to solve them. Um, so the question is, you talked about toxicology studies, and the trouble is, in both instances, we're doing some fairly, uh, the error bars on the risk assessment for dioxins, it's uh, 12 orders of magnitude, I think, are the uh, international uh, variants on things. And, and, you know, the extrapolating split tail to, to uh, um, sturgeon is also a tricky game. So what's your sense of, You've posed, you've posed that RMP needs to think about toxicology studies. How would you solve this way to compare the issues so we know whether we should be prioritizing selenium work, dioxin work, emerging contaminant work, et cetera? Hang on, I'm in, Mike, sorry. Uh, a good question, Mike. Uh, yeah, toxicology is a huge new field. But it's not like we're going to solve the issue of dioxin toxicology. Um, where I think we can make a big difference is cases where we have zero information and some of these emerging contaminants, and we just have no way of knowing whether they fall into something that we should care about or not. Um, so we're going to have to be very targeted in what we do. Um, but I think it's kind of like a, 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 I guess, understanding whether the toxicology of something like dioxin is a variable that we can constrain with our resources. Okay, maybe we should invest in that. You know, we, we're good at making those kinds of decisions once we frame the question the right way. So I think 
the bottom line is it's, we're going to have to be targeted and focused in whatever we do. What I feel is happening is that we're getting more and more information and more and more measurements that we've never had before. We're having a hard time interpreting. That's where I think we have to remind ourselves that we are more than a monitoring program. We're a program that's answering management questions. We can't answer the question of, is it something to worry about? You know, that's a gap we've got to fill with toxicology. Robin, thanks for the great overview of the selenium work that you've done and, and that others have done, um, and also for helping RMP figure out where to go next. And one of the things we'll do is try to keep the CLAM time series going. But I'm wondering what the road that you're going to be going down looks like uh, in terms of your the, the science that you'll be doing in the, in the coming years. Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, the uh, priorities for the USGS, um, as, as I understand them, um, is, is more of a focus on integrated modeling. Uh, and so uh, we're, those plans are, are getting more fleshed out in time. Um, I am specifically using this opportunity, while others are sorting out priorities, to wrap up a lot of the data that, that I've been privileged to be a part of collecting and turning that data into information that, and, and getting that out uh, as we move into this, this more of this modeling effort. Um, I'm very active with the Cascade Modeling Group working on both mercury modeling and then also selenium modeling. Um, so right now there is a lot of uncertainty as to precisely um, where exactly I'm going, but uh, there's no question right now it is a matter of pulling all the data we have now. Again, we have, with all that data, we now have a really great perspective. And if I might follow up on uh, Phil's comment to, to, to Mike, is that I think what is really important in terms of moving forward, like all of us, is and try to understand the impact of some, of some of these more difficult, what seem intractable problems, is integrating on a ecosystem level. So my, inter, my participation with field biologists, fish biologists, population biologists, ecologists, plugging the toxicity into that framework has been really important. If you really want to understand, you really need to hang out with uh, some ecologists. So. Thanks. Um, I'm interested in all your perspectives about, because um, I think you all mentioned at some point the intersection of, of policy making and decision making and um, priority setting from your own perspectives. And um, I'm increasingly struck, as Phil is, with the development of more and more data and less and less information, at least uh, that information that would be relevant to decision making. And, and rather than relegate us all to just data inputters, what role do you think from your experience? we should all be playing in terms of engendering the discussions with policymakers that need to happen to inform those priorities. Because I, I think the, the, the failure of our communication I see now is we're not connecting effectively with the uh, administrators and policymakers to understand what their questions actually are. We tend to answer questions of our own that are quite interesting and probably we think relevant. But I'm, I'm, I'm struck with how often the IEP, in this case, in my case, is being told that we're not, um, we're not considering relevant management perspectives. Um, do you care to share, uh, particularly Phil, uh, you seem to be sitting right at that intersection of policy and data and, and information generation. Yeah, so I think I would, I feel like we do get a good job of framing the questions that are relevant to managers. What I think we often fail to do is simplify the message enough that managers understand it. And when I was in my previous job and going through four years of lawsuits, I, my graphs changed from the complicated graphs and complicated statistics to the 
the bar chart to the thing that I could bring to the governor's desk and just have anybody look at it and understand it and did not need me to interpret it for them. They needed to see it for themselves and believe it for themselves. And, you know, that's not always easy. And as we get more and more types of data, it's even harder. But I think we do a good job with the question. I think we could improve our message, and that's the, that's the gap I see. Um, I, the one thing I, I would add to that, that process, what has been um, a lot of fun is my participation in this Selenium working group where, where we've got everybody at the table. So whether it's, it's Mike and I'm teasing him, rolling his eyes at the back, saying, oh, come on, Robin, like, really? And, and having this conversation or, or people with a water board saying, look, you know, how do, what do I do with this data? So I think the, the taking the time out and getting everybody together from the, the different groups in order to help all of us figure out how to better communicate with each other, I think that that's, for me, I've, I've learned a lot and benefited from that. And I think it's made us all uh, more effective at communicating the, the highest, the best message we can. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think in, in doing kind of this fashion project, um, it, you know, work groups for the RMP is, is one of the ways that we engage our stakeholders and, and really kind of hone in on, on what their key questions are. So, so having a process to kind of get reminded about what the stakeholders care most about is, is very useful. And then um, kind of having the time to kind of step back. Uh, you know, here CARB was collecting all this air data and they just kind of say, okay, here, here they are. And, and we ask them, well, did you calculate that position? And they say, no. You know. so, so there's a lot of instances where, like, different groups will have their particular interest and in kind of stops at that point and, and they don't move forward. The MMO have been collecting data and they didn't really know what to do with it. So, so having the time and, and sort of the breath to kind of um, put everything in context um, is, is helpful. You know, just to see. If nothing else, to see where your remaining gaps are and say, oh, you know, well, okay, that doesn't make sense. Like, like uh, you know, Mike was pointing out, well, that means that there's, there's something that you're kind of missing. Um, go back to the drawing board, change your conceptual model, change your numerical model, um, you know, and try to make it all work. So I'd like to add just sort of paramount to what the RMP is all about. We are well suited to take on this challenge of how to use form, have management inform science and have science inform management. And we have a, a very mature dialogue that goes on on, on a regular basis in all, our, in all our program areas. And the challenge being we don't have enough resources to answer every question to the extent that our scientists may want or even certain sectors of the management side want. But we have a, we have a process where we engage and, and debate and I know I'm one who's always saying, so what, are, what will we use those data for? What is that going to tell us that we don't already know? Because uh, we, you know, we're going to pay money for that. Something else isn't going to get for it. So we have a great process. So if you're not engaged and you're interested, we have opportunities for more participation in our, in our work with work through your sectors engaged. Okay. We got time. Lester, you, know, you have to get your hand up. One more question, I think, before we break. So we are extremely low loading estuary for dioxins when you look at the international literature on the topic. So it begs the question, are there any estuaries in the world that are not contaminated with dioxins? And then when we think about the consumption trends for oil uh, in the world and the continued increase in consumption of oil and the conversion in the future, well, it's going on right now, of plastic being the dominant use of oil, petroleum products, can you think about the trend if atmospheric deposition now is the key loading factor for the bay? What could we see the trend in dioxin toxicity being into the future? Yeah, uh, well, if I had a crystal ball, <laughs> that would be helpful. Um, I, I think there's kind of two fronts. One, one is kind of the increasing demand, you know, burning of, of coal and fossil fuels, and you know, but but sort of you know, co-benefit maybe of, of concern about global warming is maybe that's, you know, tailing off a little, not rising as exponentially as it used to. 
Um, you know, and, and so uh, certainly on a local level, you know, we've seen the phase out of incinerators and backyard burning and more EVs. So, so sort of the local component will definitely shrink. Well, probably definitely shrink. <laughs> Um, and then the global one will do what it does. You know, we, we don't necessarily have control over that, um, but, but obviously we, we do what we can locally. That will have a and well, that ends our session. So let's give them a quick. Thank you. Nice job. I like your talk. I really. So we're, we're at break time. We're running slightly off schedule. So we, we had 15 minutes planned. We're going to call it a little less then. So we'll, we're going to reconvene at 11.05. But this is a good part of the program to interact, have some refreshments. But we will we want you back in here at 11.05. And no, you can't bring refreshments in the room. That is that a the graphic? Yeah. Is that new? I can't remember seeing that before. No, no, that, that, I didn't put it in the uh, in the new report. Uh, we just put in the new numbers. But, but, but just the, this that has the template. Mm -hmm. I like. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of visually friendly. Mm -hmm. it's, uh,